Well, thank you very much. Are all these going to be on these machines? Do you think? Can I? Yes, I can. Okay, great. <laughs> well, before the Big Bang, that's a question which, had I been asked this question over about two months ago, I would have given the conventional answer. And the conventional answer, for those of you who don't know it, uh, was given by Stephen Hawking on the Richard and Judy show uh, a few uh, m weeks ago. Uh, he said, well, the Big Bang, you see, is this singular state. The whole idea of space and time uh, loses its meaning because it's a singularity. And therefore, to talk about what went on before the Big Bang is completely meaningless. And that's the conventional answer. As I say, had anybody asked me this question, and they did quite often, uh, something like over two months ago, I would have given that answer, or more or less that answer. I want to give you a very radically different answer. Uh, it's a sort of crazy idea, uh, but I think crazy ideas are the sort of thing one needs when talking about the Big Bang. Uh, I'll let me show you a few crazy ideas. These, all the ideas I'm going to show you here are put forward by very, very respectable cosmologists. doesn't make them ideas any less crazy, but uh, <laughs> first of all, I'm not sure what Friedman actually said, but uh, he certainly produced a model in which the universe... Uh, yeah. I, in many of my diagrams, time will be going up the picture like that, so get used to it. The, this is supposed to be a p diagram of the universe, which in this particular model was a sort of big sphere, and it started at a big bang, expanded to a maximum size, and then would shrink down to a crunch, and then it would start all over again. And the reason for this expectation was that the... Uh, graph, the curve, which describes the radius of this universe is a cycloid, and the cycloid just keeps on going like that. So if you believe that cycloid, you would expect the universe to go through these cycles, and so before, there would be several big bangs, and before each one would be a collapsing phase of the universe, commonly referred to as the big crunch. Now there's a version of this idea which uh, John Wheeler has uh, promoted, which is that in each of these cycles, uh, since the, nobody really knows what goes on at the uh, crunch, the, the, bang cr uh, the crunch bang stage here, um, you can more or less invent any physics you like. And uh, one idea is to suggest that the constants of nature, the fundamental constants of nature, might get changed each time you go through one of these cycles. And this might help to explain various puzzles that people find that the constants have to be just such and such in order that life should exist or something like that. I always have. Uh, trouble with many of these arguments. It's not at all clear uh, whether you need them or not. They might be true, but we don't know. It, it may be that these numbers are fixed and might, they might change through the cycle or something like that. But our current physics certainly doesn't uh, allow this kind of thing. These are singular states according to uh, classical theory. Maybe if we had quantum gravity, as we were hearing um, Abhai talking about earlier, one could imagine such a, a scheme where uh, you somehow get through with some kind of quantum physics. Somewhat more exotic is the idea put forward by Lee Smolin in his book. You see, these pictures are rather hard to draw, and this is, has some significance in what I want to say. The difficulty in drawing the diagram seems to me a little bit of a drawback. It may mean that there is something a little uh, troublesome about the geometry, and I'll come to that <laughs> shortly. But you see, here we have uh, black holes forming, you must imagine that each one of these, just take this sort of funnel thing here, that's supposed to represent the universe as we know it, uh, which expands from a big bang, and then its expansion accelerates because of the presence of this, whatever we call it, dark energy, or if you're more boring like me, the cosmological constant. Um, and that's allowed to uh, make the universe continue to expand. But according to Smolin, uh, all these black holes which form at various places uh, could be the origins of new universes, and you see them sprouting off various places like that, and you can adopt the Wheeler idea of maybe having the constants of nature changing through each one of these phases. Okay, if you want fantasy, uh, <laughs> then uh, very respectable people, I should say. Uh, this is an idea which involves, well, first of all, you have to believe in string theory as well. Uh, you have to believe in these extra dimensions and the D-brains and so on. And these D-brains are supposed to have collided 
in the period before the Big Bang, and uh, there they come together and produced our uh, Big Bang that we know and love or hate, whatever it is, and that expands out like this. Now, <coughs> the trouble with all these things is there is a strong element of fantasy. We really haven't the remotest idea uh, about this, what kind of physics is supposed to go on here. But there's a more serious problem, which is the real one I want to address. And this more serious problem has different forms. One of these forms is simply said in terms of the second law of thermodynamics, which I'll come to first, and then it's related to a geometrical issue, which I say these pictures are hard to draw. They're hard to draw because the singularity in the black hole doesn't really fit on the Big Bang singularity. It's, it's a stretch of geometrical imagination that these things could really go together in the way indicated. Because it doesn't make them wrong, because as I said, we really do need some fantasy, and this is an example of this possible kind of fantasy that we might need. But uh, I want to give you a different kind, which uh, in my own belief is, has some greater plausibility about it. So let me first say something about the second law of thermodynamics. In its simplest form, second law of thermodynamics is expressed something like this. <laughs> you imagine uh, here a, a glass of wine sitting on the edge of the table and it falls off and wine splashes out into the carpet and so on. Now if you f just think of this as a Newtonian situation, uh, as the system evolves, um, the thing proceeds according to Newtonian laws, but Newtonian laws are reversible in time, so you could equally well have this is the first frame, this is the second, and this is the third. They would all be equally consistent with Newtonian uh, dynamics. What's not so uh, agreeable about this first, this second, and this third is that it violates the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics, roughly speaking, tells you that randomness increases with time, uh, it's a sort of depressing law, if you like. Uh, depends on how you look at it, really. But it's telling you that randomness increases. I want to be a bit more explicit about what it really says in a moment. But the randomness is measured in some sense by a thing called entropy, and it's telling us that this entropy is increasing <coughs> with time. Now, entropy can be... There's always a bit of trouble in giving a really precise definition, but it can be given a, a clearer definition. Uh, really, the idea deals with Bolt Boltzmann. What we do is we imagine what's called a phase space. This is a, a space here uh, of very large number of dimensions where each point in this space represents a state of the system at one moment. In fact, it contains both the positions of all the particles and the momentum or the velocities of all the particles. So if you know where the point is in this <coughs> large dimensional space at any moment, that describes a particular thing, could be this situation here, then... Uh, the dynamics will tell you where that point moves so that there will be a unique path through that point wiggling around somewhere uh, through this phase space. Now, the thing is that some of these regions may be really pretty well indistinguishable. For example, the air in the, in the room, you might have molecules in somewhere different places and so on. And so you might like to say, well, we don't really care where the individual molecules are, we just care about uh, overall parameters. And so we lump together... Uh, the systems which look very much the same. It's a bit vague, that, but let's say with regard to macroscopic parameters, we lump them together, and so we have these things called uh, uh, coarse graining cells in the phase space, and you then say, well, let's measure the volume <coughs> of these regions, and the volume is V here, and the logarithm of that volume is the entropy. This is a marvelous formula due to Boltzmann. This is Boltzmann's constant. The only thing in the formula that wasn't due to Boltzmann, as I understand it, was Boltzmann's constant. Uh, I think this was named afterwards. Um, he didn't, wasn't particularly interested in, in constants, so uh, that was, he just was interested in the ideas. But you see, it's a very uh, plausible thing now that the entropy should increase all the time. Well, the thing to bear in mind is that these volumes here are absolutely enormously different in scale. If you look at this, okay, this one looks a bit bigger than that one, but I can't really convey to you in the picture the absolute stupendous difference in the sizes of these volumes. So if you happen to find yourself in one of them and you wiggle around, the next one you find yourself in will be overwhelmingly likely to be uh, much, much larger and the entropy therefore goes up. So if you like, this is a pretty trivial 
uh, exp exp expression of the fact that the entropy increases. And so you say, this, here's entropy going up here in time this way. This is now. And so you say the likelihood is the entropy is going up. The only trouble with this argument is that if you try to apply it in the past, <coughs> and you say, what's the most likely way that the glass could have got here sitting on the corner like that, the same argument would tell you, well, the most likely way is it started a mess on the floor and then it jumped up like this onto the, onto the edge of the table, and that's clearly wrong. At least it's wrong in the universe as we know it. So it's telling you that this explanation is not a complete answer. See, what it's telling you is that if you know the entropy now, the likelihood is, in the absence of any other constraint, that it goes up. But the same argument would apply in the past, tell you that this is what would have most been most likely to happen in the past, but that isn't what happened. What happened was something quite different. So this is telling you that there is a constraint in the past, in some sense, which is pulling this curve down. Okay, well, we can help the curve along to see what it was at the remote past, where you have to keep on going. As long as the second law really applied all the time, ever since the Big Bang, then this curve must go down and down and down and down. And so the constraint is that somehow it started off in some very small region of phase space volume. And that's something quite apart from this argument here. This argument doesn't tell you that. Now, what I want to try and persuade you uh, is that the uh, well, entropy continues to go down until we get a very s small phase space volume. And uh, the claim is that it's what is peculiar about the initial state is the geometry of the universe. It's the geometry and not the matter in the universe. And one reason I say that is why do we believe in a Big Bang anyway? And one of the most powerful arguments for believing in a Big Bang is this uh, presence of the microwave background uh, which we see all over the sky which is uh, essentially um, the, the flash of the Big Bang. Well, as, as you explained, it's not really the flash of the Big Bang. It's a lot later than the original Big Bang. But nevertheless, think of it that way. Uh, there was this big flash which took place and uh, it cooled down as the universe expanded. And the temperature here is about 2.7 degrees absolute. Uh, but uh, that's basically what you're seeing. And the fact that that's there uh, tells us that uh, we have a... I'll put this up here, I think. Um, tells us that we have a very hot initial state, in fact, a hot thermal state. And the reason it's a thermal state is that we have curves like this. This is an old curve, the newer curves uh, even better. The, the line is the famous Planck formula, which tells you what black body radi radiation, uh, it gives you the intensity as a function of the frequency. Uh, and it has this very characteristic shape, telling you that you're looking back at some system in thermal equilibrium the present data, these the data points are even tighter on the curve than in this picture here. Uh, but you see it's a very good uh, black body curve telling you that the initial universe really was very much in thermal equilibrium. But what is thermal equilibrium? Well, thermal equilibrium, I didn't quite say it here, but it's the last, largest region in this space here. It's maximum entropy. That's what thermal equilibrium means, if you like. Uh, but if it was maximum entry to begin with, how could it have been going up <coughs> ever since? And that is a basic paradox, if you like. At least it would be a paradox if that were the whole story. So why isn't it the whole story? Well, let me give you another picture here, which is uh, more or less saying the same thing as I've been saying, but uh, perhaps a little bit more strongly. Here is... Uh, the spa phase space of the whole universe, rather crudely drawn, I'm afraid. Uh, and here we have the various different um, regions, the uh, coarse graining boxes. And the yellow one here is supposed to be where we are now, if you like. And uh, here we have the Big Bang sitting in this very, very tiny region. It has to be very tiny because the entropy was a lot smaller than the later regions. And now, let's try and use an argument at random. So we, I'm, I've got a curve here, you see, which is representing the history of the universe. And I'm going to throw this... Well, I might throw it at random into that diagram. If I throw it at random in the diagram, it's almost certainly going to lie in the maximum entropy region the whole time. It might be it will you know, make a brief excursion into one of these other regions like this, but the picture you're going to expect is something like that. But we're given something else. We're given what we see about the universe now. We, we know we're in this yellow region. So then the most likely thing is that it sits something like that. 
this is basically repeating what I just said. And so you're, it's telling you that the entropy started high, went down, down and down, till we got to where we are now, and then it started going up again. But that's not what happened. What happened is the tail end of this picture happened to be at this tiny little region which represents the Big Bang, and we have to understand, uh, first of all, how small is it, and secondly, why was it so small, and why did we start that way? So I'll just leave you with that question. Okay, now I think I'll take the fantasy pictures away, at least those ones, and uh, <laughs> leave the uh, diagram that we just talked about here, if I can see where t equals zero or something like that. Okay. Now, what do we know about the universe as a whole? Well, it looks something like this. Better drawn than that, but uh, more or less what it looks like. This is, again, time going up the picture. The Big Bang is this thing at the bottom. Uh, there are three basic models, uh, as far as we know, depending on the spatial curvature. It could be zero. That's the sort of popular one. It could be negative. That's the one I like. It could be positive, that's the one Stephen Hawking likes, or at least I don't know what he likes now, but he did at one time. So there are various possibilities, and they're all allowed by the present data, more or less because the present data is telling them roughly like this, and since there are errors, it means it could be either this one or this one. Uh, so we really don't know, is the answer. Um, now, that's the Big Bang. I should say they only look rather like each other now because of this cosmological constant. It makes the pictures easy to draw because they all look the same, more or less, apart from the spatial curvature. Uh, don't have a big crunch to worry about. Um, I've got the singularity in the initial state, which is the Big Bang. I've also drawn some red lines here, which also represent singularities. Those are meant to be the singularities in black holes. So I'm going to have to say something about black holes. But before coming to black holes, and let me put this over here. So you can keep the universe in mind. Um, let me just say something about uh, how matter behaves with respect to the second law um, without worrying too much about black holes for the moment. This is the way the sort of usual discussion tends to go about talking about increasing entropy. And here we have a gas in a box. And you might say it starts in one corner and... Uh, as time proceeds, it spreads out over the box, and this represents an increase in entropy. So the system is getting more and more random as time goes on. Time increasing, entropy increasing. But suppose these are gravitating bodies instead, so they're uh, celestial bodies or something. Then there's a counter tendency for these things to uh, clump together through gravity. So they could start off uniformly uh, and then start to clump. So that now we still have time increasing and entropy increasing in this direction, but the appearance, the just general appearance, is quite different. So you see, there are two competing tendencies. There, there's this one and this one, and what it actually happens may depend on the details. But you see that what we find about the universe, what's, what's rather special about the universe, or particularly special about the universe, is its uniformity. This is the, the key point. And since it's uniform, that means that as far as matter is concerned, okay, that's consistent with it being maximum entropy. So this picture I showed you before about the, 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 the entropy curve, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's I mean, about the uh, black body curve. That's consistent with that because a uniform uh, universe would be consistent with uh, thermal equilibrium for the matter. But as far as gravity is concerned, it's telling you it's a very special state. So this is what's special. It's the gravity that's special, not the, not the rest of the situation. Now, I want to say something about the form that that uh, uniformity takes. Well, before I get to that, let me make a, a more uh, down-to-earth comment. Um, you see, this is how we experience in, in our everyday lives the uh, uh, entropy and so on. So here's the sun and there's the earth and us on it and so on. People often say we get energy from the sun, but that's a bit misleading because during the course of the day and night, uh, the earth throws away about as much energy it gets from the sun. Uh, so we don't get energy from the sun, but what we do get is energy in a low entropy form. That's because the sun is a hot body in a background 
dark sky, and this means that the uh, Planck's formula, E equals h nu, that means that the energy per photon, because the sun is hotter, is much greater. So that means that for the same amount of energy coming in as going out, there are many, many more photons going out than coming in. So that means there are fewer degrees of freedom describing the energy coming in as there are going out. The, degree, the energy is spread over more degrees of freedom, so this is high entropy form of energy going out and low entropy form of energy coming in. So it's basically an entropy question. And in order to keep ourselves alive, we depend on the plants, which uh, uh, build up themselves up by photosynthesis and so on, and animals eat them, and we eat plants or animals or whatever. And uh, we're all the time trying to keep our entropy from... We're fighting against the second law, if you like. That's all the time. It's not that we're trying to get fat by eating, uh, eating too much, which is what can happen, but that's not the point. The point is to keep our entropy down. Uh, and we do that ultimately by living off the fact that the, we have the low entropy sun as, a, as opposed to the high entropy background. And this is because the sun is there, if you like. That's the key point. The sun is there. Uh, and it, you see, if you had a, a uniform distribution of, of uh, the same temperature all over the sky, that would be no use whatsoever. You get this energy coming in all the time but we make use of it because of this en en temperature imbalance on the sky. And, uh, and that's, that's the important point. Now, why is there a temperature imbalance? There's a temperature imbalance for all sorts of complicated reasons about nuclear uh, processes and so on, but that the ultimately it all comes down to the fact that the sun is there, and the sun is there because it's held together by gravity. And it's gravity which allowed the clumping of material, which was previously uniformly distributed into this... Uh, things like the sun, which are uh, more localized and hotter. So it's, so it's the gravitational clumping, which is what we're looking to. So I, d I really just wanted to say that uh, the more familiar aspects of uh, um, entropy increase or the, lo the lowness of entropy all have to do with this uh, fact that the gravitational was previously uniform and, it, and it's the potential for that uh, for matter to clump, which is what we're living off. And that's the key thing. Okay, so gravitational clumping, that's the key point. But then I said, what about black holes? And in this picture here, you see the sort of extreme maximum thing that can happen is material all condensing in a black hole. So I should show you a picture of a black hole. Um, I guess I can do that here. There's a picture of a black hole. Time going up the page. And if you're not familiar with these things, uh, you ought to see what a light cone looks like because I've drawn light cones in that picture. This is just the history of a flash of light, if you like. If there's an event in space-time, time going up the picture again. This is a spatial picture. So the different slices through this light cone represent a snapshots of uh, what's happened at different moments of time. So we have the initial flash, and then it's got out to here. That represents that section. And then out to here, that represents this section. You have to bear in mind, of course, that I tend to draw these cones as though they're two-dimensional objects, whereas, of course, they're really three-dimensional, as you, I'm trying to indicate in this picture here. These sl slices through are really spheres, but we don't have to worry too much about that. Also, you don't have to worry too much about the bottom picture, which is just showing you what happens with it according to relativity. But, um, okay, there are the light cones. Black hole, here we have collapsing matter, and here we have what's called the horizon, and here we have a singularity in the middle, so the black hole collapses to the singular state in the middle, um, where curvatures diverge to infinity. And uh, here we have the feature of the horizon is that if you have an external observer trying to look in, then you have to follow the light cones. You see the light cones are all tipped over, so they're tangential to this horizon. And that means that no signal <coughs> can escape from inside to the outside. Once it's got in here, it's forced inwards, you see whereas outside it can still escape. So that means if you look at this thing, the light gets dragged right back and you see the body before it fell into the black hole. You don't actually see much of it because by the time you see it, the, uh, there's an, an enormous redshift effect so that basically you see nothing. But anyway, that's the general picture for a black hole, just to give you a feeling for it. But now, we've got to explain now why, not why the 
just why the universe was so special in the initial state, but why it was so special in the particular way that it seems to have been. That is that, okay, matter was thermalized, but gravity was special, and you had a un uniform universe which somehow uh, <coughs> didn't allow the gravitational degrees of freedom to become thermalized with the matter as well. Um, I mean, they somehow kept aloof, and only much later on did those gravitational degrees of freedom um, start to play their role. <coughs> well, here I've just uh, said these things in words, basically. And the thing we've got to worry about, perhaps I'll put the black hole up here for the moment. Um, you see, we have a point that I'm trying to emphasize here, which is always struck me as being the basic puzzle um, of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is not... So the puzzle is not that it's a singular state so much, but it's a very special singular state. It has to be very special, <coughs> or we wouldn't have a second law of thermodynamics at all. Um, but we can understand something about the way in which it's special. I'm trying to find my cosmology picture, which is probably... Yes, here it is. Right. Let me... I'll put that over here. There's a, too many of these machines, I think, so I don't quite know where to go. <laughs> <coughs> here, here are all our universes. And I want to try and suggest the way in which that Big Bang was special. Uh, well, it's basically... Uh, and also the odds against it coming about by chance. That's a, a, a sort of key thing. We can work this out uh, from uh, a famous formula due to Bekenstein and Hawking. I'll come to that in a minute. But just let me give you the, the figure, more or less. It really depends <coughs> how big the universe is and how much matter you're taking into consideration. I'm not taking dark matter into consideration here because... We don't know much about it, so let's not. It doesn't matter much. We take all the rest of it, take the baryonic matter into account, and maybe there are about 10 to the 80th baryons or so within the observable universe. And uh, then you want to know how a black hole of that... You see, how, what is the possible entropy that the universe could have achieved see, if it weren't just this very nice, uh, smooth initial state that we actually seem to find? Uh, what is potentially open to it, well, you, you could say, well, all the matter might collapse into a black hole. And uh, if it did, then the formula due to Bekenstein and Hawking, I'll, I'll give you that in a moment, uh, gives you a, a figure something like this, that the chance of that arising by, well, the, the odds against it arising purely by chance is something like one part in 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 123. Uh, just to give you some feeling for the scale of that number, if you wanted to write this out in the conventional way, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, etc., there wouldn't be nearly enough room on all the protons if you tried to put a zero on each proton in the observable universe that would fall far short of being able to write that number down. So, it, it gives you... Of course, I can do it by cheating, by using double <laughs> exponents, but uh, not really cheating. It's mathematics, isn't it? That's not cheating. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, we can write down the number, but not in that way. So, uh, here we are. Of course, it's not zeros. You have to bear that in mind. But uh, who knows what they are. Okay, so what is it that's special here about the geometry? The matter's not special, but something special about the geometry. Well, I made a proposal some while ago that it's what's called the vial curvature is zero or constrained in some particular way. Now, I have to explain what the vial curvature is. I'm not assuming everybody knows that here. But uh, there is a hypothesis here, which is just a hypothesis. <coughs> and the hypothesis is that whereas the singularities in black holes can do what they like, and that's what they seem to do, is what they like, which is to uh, have a wildly diverging vial curvature. Um, however, the Big Bang is constrained in this way, which can be expressed as saying that the vial curvature in the neighborhood of this initial state is very small or very constrained or zero or something. Certainly very, uh, very constrained. And I think uh, I need to say something about... Uh, well, let, let me... Before I explain what the vial curvature is, let me uh, just say what I'm saying again a little more strongly. We try to estimate the size of the total phase space volume for the amount of matter... <coughs> Uh, we see, sorry, the amount of matter that we see in the observable universe, let's say 10 to the 80th baryons, use that figure, 
Um, there's a lot more matter because of the dark matter, but we don't know what that is, so let's leave that off. Um, what is the maximum entropy state for that? And then you imagine it all in a black hole and use the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, which is given here. Uh, and uh, it, it, it gives you absolutely an enormous entropy for uh, any uh, sizable um, astronomical object. So uh, uh, the, the A that appears here is the crucial thing. The rest of these things are just ordered constants of nature. That's Planck's constant, the speed of light, the gra Newton gravitational constant. So this is Planck's constant. Boltzmann's constant, Planck's constant, speed of light, uh, Newton's gravitational constant. Sometimes you put all those equal to one and it's just A over four. Makes it look nicer. Um, and the A is proportional to the square of a mass. So as the mass goes up, you see this uh, area goes up and the entropy goes up as the square of that mass. <coughs> so that means that uh, you have larger entropy if you have, say so if you had two black holes, bring them together, then the entropy will be doubled when they're... Uh, is that doubled? Well, it's, it's m squared. What am I saying? Anyway, <laughs> it goes up by a lot, M much more than that. The, the entropy goes up by uh, the square of the mass, whereas the mass is only doubled when you bring them together. So it goes up. It was doubled, isn't it? Sorry, what? I can't think when I'm standing up here. Four, yes, it's four times if the mass is doubled, then the entropy goes up by four. Um, anyway, so here's... This is, the, now this is the phase space, again, this picture. And here we have the universe as we find it now, and here we have the universe at the Big Bang. You can see those three things. Of course, it's not remotely drawn to scale because uh, the, the, this thing here, that total volume, is of the order of 10 to the 10 to the 123. Uh, this is, well, I think I give it on to another transparency here. See, here we have 10 to the 10 to the 123. This is what we see now, about 10 to the 10 to the 101. And here we have, uh, um, at the time of decoupling, where we see the um, black body radiation, 10 to the 10 to the 88, and the Big Bang itself, a lot smaller than that. When you play with numbers like this, an important thing to realize is that it doesn't make a hoot of difference. If you want to divide one by the other, it doesn't make a hoot of difference what the one at the bottom is. <laughs> you see, uh, if you divide 10 to the 10 to the 123 by 10 to the 10 to the 88, it's the same as 10 to the 10 to the 123 divided by 10 to the 111 by 101, and it's the same as a 10 to the 10 to the 123. These numbers don't make any impression on the numerator at all. <laughs> and, and you see, uh, it's a point, point made by, I remember, uh, Littlewood when he was giving his undergraduate uh, fun lectures the, when I was at Cambridge, I remember a long time ago. Anyway, so you see this phenomenon taking place here. So really all you need to know is that thing there, which is telling you how extraordinary tiny any of these things are in relation to that whole volume. So we have a huge puzzle to explain. Um, now, let me say something about the vial curvature. I warned you I would actually say something about that. Here we have the Galilei-Einstein principle of equivalence, which is basic to general relativity. Here we have Galileo dropping a big rock and a little rock, whether or not he actually did it. Uh, from the top of the leaning tower and they fall together and here we have a little insect on the big rock looking at the little rock and since they fall together this little rock seems to hover as though there were no gravity and this is more familiar now that we talk about space travel and so on the astronaut and the space station uh, they seem to hover as though there were no gravity despite the fact that the earth is right there this is only partially uh, a picture of what goes on because I'll put that one over here because um, gravity is not uniform we actually have deviations from a uniform field and when we take them into account well it's more like this uh, we have to consider the slight deviations here we have the astronaut in the middle surrounding himself with a sphere of particles or herself and here we have the acceleration of the astronaut to the center of the Earth. Of course, the astronaut could be in orbit. The, this is just accelerations I'm talking about towards the center. And the points on the sphere that's surrounding the astronaut are directed slightly differently because the Earth's center is not at infinity. And so the acceleration is a bit more here, a bit less here, a bit inwards here, and a bit inwards here, which leads to a distortion of that sphere into an ellipsoid. That's what's called the tidal effect. And it's the tidal effect which Einstein directly 
measures with his uh, curvature, same thing which uh, you're looking at with your gravitational detectors and so on. Um, so it's the distortion of elliptical shapes into, sorry, spherical shapes into the elliptical ones. And the vial curvature is the direct measure that, uh, of this distortion, whereas the Ricci curvature is the volume reduction that you would find if you happen to have surrounded the whole Earth with uh, these the sphere of particles, then the acceleration in, inwards always. But here you have uh, the kind of curvature which is produced directly by matter, and that's the Ricci curvature, according to Einstein. And the vial part of the curvature is, if you like, what's left. That's the distortion part. This is a slightly simplified picture, but let's leave it at that. And let me show you the space-time version of it. Here we have the vial part, which is this distortion. This is time going up the picture again. These are the world lines of particles on the sphere surrounding the astronaut, going in in some directions, out in other directions. And when they surround the Earth, they come in all the way around. This is the Ritchie part. That's the vial part. To be more actually precise about this, I should do it with light rays, um, which is actually a quite a familiar thing. It's what you see, what Eddington observed when looking at the sun, which gravitational uh, lensing effects are noticing that you, if you, here's your past light cone and you find ma the light rays being pulled in when they go by a massive body, <coughs> such as the sun here, and this is this lensing effect which is familiar, and uh, you see in this region you find um, what would have been a, a circular shape being distorted in an ellipse, whereas in the middle of the sun it would just get <coughs> expanded outwards. So you see these, the Ritchie part in here and the vile part out there, that's all I'm saying. Don't worry too much about the details of this, it's just uh, partly to show you why we call this space-time curvature because, well, this, this is the picture we should be looking at now. Uh, you see it's really just the effects that you have for geodesics on a positively curved surface, they come together, on a negatively curved surface they go apart, and here we're seeing a mixture of the two effects the rays coming together this way, going apart this way, and uh, that's the, why, why we think of space-time curvature as uh, what describes gravity in, in Einstein's theory. So you, that, that's the way to think of it. But anyway, I really was, wanted to say what the vile part was. That's the volume-preserving part of the um, focusing, if you like. The volume-reducing part is the Ritchie part here. Um, a little bit more accurately in terms of light rays, but this is essentially the idea. Just a moment, uh, I don't know if I should spend too much time on this, but um, one of the types of argument that people often bring up in this context has to do with inflation. Uh, and I just want to say that inflation is certainly not adequate to explain the flatness and uniformity that is the big puzzle. Um, you often hear people say, that uh, it is an explanation. Uh, you, inflation depends upon uh, the, the something prior to it, which is already uh, very, very special in the way that I'm describing. Um, <coughs> the idea is that people say, for example, if you look in different directions, you see the temperature of the background radiation is almost exactly the same all the way around. And so the argument is, uh, how could it be the same? Uh, if those regions of, regions of space-time were never in causal contact with each other. In fact, I have a, a picture of that here. This is the top picture. I'm going to start using pictures like this. They're really rather helpful in the present discussion. This is a, a conformal diagram. Here's us up here. And I've stretched the Big Bang out. It's very useful just to, to use diagrams like this. It's purely mathematics. It's not, I'm not saying it has any physical uh, significance, at least not at the moment. This is just a mathematical picture. You can stretch out the Big Bang and draw it like this. So here is you looking back and you're looking at two regions and those two regions are only aware of what went on in this part of the Big Bang, if you like. In the conventional model, these two regions were never in causal contact. And that refers to two things you might be looking at in different directions. You say, how could those temperatures ever have been the same if they depend on physics, which was never in causal contact with each other. This part over here could never have 
influence the other. And I should say, in these diagrams, the light cones are all always tipped up at 45 degrees. So there's a light cone, and you can put it wherever you like in the picture. And so it gives you some good idea of which regions could influence which other regions, bearing in mind that causal effects have to be within the light cone. So, so this region here is dependent upon a completely separate part of the Big Bang. And so you say, how could they ever thermalize? And therefore you say, well, perhaps there was some, this model is not right, this is the conventional cosmology, and that there was an inflationary early phase, and one of the effects of inflation is to push this Big Bang back, in a sense, so that these regions are now in causal contact. Uh, the trouble is, okay, they, in causal contact, so you could say they thermalized, and therefore that's why the temperatures were equal. But the trouble is that that argument is no good. I mean, it's, it's true that it brings them into causal contact, but it isn't any good. Why isn't it any good? Because what does thermalization do? It increases the entropy. See, thermalization means, well, the sort of typical example I'm using here is you have a hot body and a cold body, and you bring them into contact. The hot body gets cooler, and the cold body gets warmer, and that's the thing that's supposed to be going on here. But that is a process which involves the increasing of the entropy. So it's, in a certain sense, making the problem worse because the problem we've got to explain is why the universe was so special at the beginning. And introducing a thermalization process is simply demanding that it's even more special than it was before. So it's not an argument without something which tells you why it was so special beforehand. I just want to emphasize that. The other uh, point that's often made is that the, you expand out by inflation a small region and, and somehow it makes it look very smooth on the large. This also doesn't work. I think I won't go into the details of that, but it's a similar sort of reason. You really need the universe to start off in a very special way, and introducing inflation in the meantime does not help. It really only makes the problem a bit worse. It really doesn't have much to say about it. If you want to, you want the initial state has to be very, very special, and something like saying the vial curvature hypothesis, which is saying that the universe was of a kind with very small, very constrained vial curvature. Now I want to say something a bit more about diagrams like this because they're very helpful in, in this kind of discussion. So let me, perhaps I'll put this one over here because I don't think we need that anymore. Um, in my book, uh, The Road to Reality, I sort of talk about two kinds of conformal diagram. Just conformal diagrams, which are uh, really like that one over there, which uh, schematic, but certainly gives you a good idea of what's going on. And you could have what you could call strict conformal diagrams. Uh, I basically introduced the general kind, and it was really Carter who introduced the strict ones. I think that's probably the right way to divide the credit, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, now, he, uh, these diagrams here I'm going to introduce uh, are basically strict ones. And I have a sort of color coding or a symmetry axis is introduced by a dotted line. That's what that, the dotted line in orange means a symmetry axis. A green spot means a point in the four dimensional space. Infinity is this purple line. Singularity, a wiggly red line. And if I have a little circle, that means it's a two sphere. Now, the diagram you have to imagine is rotated about the symmetry axis. So that stays put. Every point in this here goes ro rotating around. So you have to think of each point apart from on the symmetry axis represents a sphere, a two-sphere. If it's a spot like that, it's really gone down to a point. So these are three points here. And this is an example of Minkowski space. So those of you who know what the conformal picture for Minkowski space is, you'll see that this is a strict conformal diagram of it. If you want collapse to a black hole, I probably lost my black hole picture, but it might confuse you more even to see why it's the same as this picture, so let me not bring the other one back. Uh, here we have null infinity. I'll use the terminology scry for null infinity. It really stands for script I, but I was told in Polish it means, it means boundary, which is a remarkable coincidence. Um, so here we, have, uh, uh, here we have infinity. That's infinity, infinity. Uh, here we have a singularity. Here, the yellow one is the horizon, um, and here we have a symmetry axis. So this is a collapse to a black hole, essentially a picture I showed you before. 
Uh, here we have collapse to a black hole, which then disappears via Hawking radi evaporation. Now this is uh, something which is going to play a key role in what I want to say here. And so I have a picture. And so I have a picture of a black hole disappearing by Hawking radiation. Well, why does it do that? Well, you see, not only does a black hole have an entropy, but it also has a temperature. And this was a key thing that Stephen Hawking uh, pointed out and uh, explained why it had, an uh, had a temperature and what the value of that was. Bekenstein had previously suggested that it should have a, an entropy, but uh, it was Hawking who gave the actual very precise value that this, and, and Albert was talking about this earlier, about how you might get the thing out of more general quantum gravity considerations. But anyway, I'm going to assume this formula, and the formula gives you also a temperature as well as an <coughs> entropy, and so that the black hole is slightly hot. I should say only very, very slightly hot, because any black hole that we know about in the universe has a temperature which is way down. I'm not quite sure how it compares with the smallest temperature that's been ever produced in the lab, but it gives you some feeling that it's cold. Okay, so you need to have the universe thinned down quite a lot, cooled off quite a lot, uh, before the black hole will start to worry about its temperature being higher than that of the background, which will ultimately happen. Um, certainly in the models of the universe that I've been showing you here, uh, because they do ultimately expand, uh, and the ex ex expansion starts to accelerate, and this goes on and on, uh, and the temperature will then get reduced and reduced and reduced, until finally it goes down to below that of the black hole itself. The black hole is therefore hotter than its background, starts to radiate. As it radiates, it loses energy. As it loses energy, it loses uh, mass. As it loses mass, its temperature goes up, and this is a sort of unstable thing. Eventually, it goes up and up and up, and I say it goes off with a pop. I say pop rather than bang, because by astrophysical standards, it's a pretty small explosion, uh, even though it wouldn't be a very pleasant thing to have around in the room. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, that's, so pop isn't such a bad description, and the radiation is coming out like this. Now, I don't think, although there's a lot of argument about these things in various circles, I don't think this picture is being disputed, basically, except that there's one school of thought that believes there's a sort of remnant which hangs along at the end after this. Uh, I don't want that, so uh, I'm going to... In, in the picture I'm going to present to you, there are a number of things that should be true about the world which are quite independent of... Uh, at least when I say quite independent, they don't seem to be uh, intimately connected with the problem that, that I'm going to address, namely the... Uh, what went on before the Big Bang, but I have to address them. One is, them is that the black hole will actually disappear. So I want all black holes hanging around, no matter how big they are, finally to go away and to end up as radiation right here. Here we have a conformal diagram for it. Don't worry too much about that, but that's, uh, that's the picture we want here. So the black holes, I want them all to go away eventually. Uh, just for fun, I've got the various cosmologies here. It's the same things we've just been seeing here. Uh, well, first of all, without the cosmological constant, and these are the conformal diagrams for them, the strict conformal diagrams, and these are the ones with cosmological constant. So let me just leave them there. Uh, it seems that we're in one of these, so the conformal diagram is one of those. Now, uh, the idea here really springs from the appearance, if you like, of these pictures. Now, you see, in these pictures, uh, you have a certain symmetry about the horizontal line here. If I flip them over, they look just the same. There is a very big difference, though. That is that they start off with a singular state and they end up at infinity. Now, you see, this is just mathematical tricks because the... Well, there are two mathematical tricks here. One of them is the treatment of the Big Bang by regarding it as a... You see, I've drawn it with a wiggly line, but it's really, in this picture, just a straight line. It's perfectly regular, and Paul Todd has been the person who's most uh, worked on this, and uh, I think it's the best way of looking at the viral curvature hypothesis to say that the universe could be extended as a conformal space 
through the Big Bang. Now that's, as I say, a mathematical trick. It's very handy. Uh, you can do calculations and so on. There's an older mathematical trick, which is treating infinity also as something you might extend through. So, a lot of people here will be familiar with these ideas. It's a nice way of treating gravitational radiation. You say, well, you introduce a conformal factor and you, you uh, can handle, you can handle uh, all sorts of quite um, subtle and complicated issues to do with gravitational radiation by pretending that there is a boundary at the future which represents infinity. Now, the pictures that I've drawn here are the ones which you get with a positive cosmological constant. The ones that I've drawn here are the ones with a zero cosmological constant. And notice that these aren't symmetrical. And if you like, it's my being persuaded that there probably is a cosmological constant that has, for a long time, I've preferred these models because that's, I suppose, what I used to work with, things where you look at asymptotic flatness and so on. But the ideas work just as well and in some sense better if you consider a positive cosmological constant. And uh, this rather leads to the wild suggestion, which I have drawn these pictures here. These are meant to be uh, wild-looking pictures. It's a crazy, fantastical idea that uh, somehow the remote future is the same as the next Big Bang. Now, the only reason you can get away with this, if you can get away with it, is that the geometry that one's talking about needn't be the full metric geometry of Einstein's general relativity, but a conformal geometry. Let me make a point, which is perhaps quite a strong one here. That is, that in these discussions, where you either talk about the Big Bang or, or the remote future, uh, you're really looking at almost all the metric. You see, the metric has... 10 components, and one of them is the one you're allowing freedom. That is the overall scale. That overall scale can be anything you like. Um, sorry. Uh, but uh, the other nine components are perfectly regular. And this is why this kind of picture is useful and why Paul has found it useful and why other people have found it useful to talk about gravitational radiation and so on is that you really have got almost all the metric there. You've got nine of the ten components. And they're all perfectly regular and they behave perfectly well. It's just that one other component, which is the overall scale, which has gone wild on you. So, I'm really treating here in this picture the past singularity very different, differently from the, the future ones. You see, the future ones were in black holes. The black holes have all evaporated away and they've gone. Okay, the singularity was there, but they've disappeared and you're not interested in them anymore. The, the Big Bang... Uh, is, you see, here's the future ones in the black holes here, but let's remove them because we're not talking about them now. Uh, I want now to draw this picture in what I regard as a more satisfactory way by uh, really basically gluing together pictures at the bottom over there. Uh, positive lambda you need, uh, otherwise this, this doesn't work. Now, there are a number of features which go into this which are necessary for the picture. First of all, let's think about the remote future. Now, why can we get away with this in the remote future? Well, the presumption is, and here I sort of relying on, Freeman Dyson wrote a, a wonderful paper quite a number of years ago looking at the very, 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 very remote future and trying to, uh, trying to argue that you could still have life going on in such a universe. Well, I'm not going to go that far here. And also, I... Uh, I contacted him quite recently about this article of his and said, what happens when you have a cosmological constant? And he said, well, the whole thing is completely wrong and you have to do it all over again. And he referred, this is his paper here, he referred to a Scientific American article in 1999 uh, which uh, addresses this issue in the background of a cosmological constant. But nevertheless, these are the things one has to think about. What happens to black holes? They eventually disappear. What happens to protons? Well... Maybe they eventually decay. Uh, well, now I start to worry about other things. What happens to electrons? You see, electrons are one of the biggest problems in this model. I want, what I want, you see, is that everything should end up as radiation. When I say radiation, I mean massless radiation. 
so that there's no mass left in the universe. The problem with this picture is mass. If there's mass hanging around, then you can build clocks, basically. It's mass that allows the ticking of a clock to have meaning. Uh, without mass, there's nothing to measure the passage of time. You can think of this basically in terms of Einstein's uh, special relativity. You think of, okay, what's around in the universe at this time? Um, it was partly, this model is partly stimulated by the thought that it would be pretty boring to live in such a universe. You just go on and on and on and nothing much happens. The black holes eventually disappear. Take That's pretty boring, waiting for a black hole to disappear. And then it goes on and really nothing interesting happens at all. But then you must bear in mind what's there to enjoy that universe. Nothing but massless radiation. And massless radiation, well, photons and other massless entities, they don't experience time at all. A photon just... Uh, its, its origin and its, its end are, are all happen instantly, so it doesn't, it doesn't worry at all. Eternity is no time at all to a photon. So that's one way of looking at it, you see. This, the contents of this universe somehow, uh, well, the, the, the final state, this infinity state, uh, is more or less there already. They don't worry about it. It's only massive things which really concerned with, with the passage of time. The, passage of t the universe forgets, if you like, the passage of time and is really to be described now as a conformal manifold. When I say conformal manifold, I mean a manifold, a space-time in which you have this kind of invariance. This is more for the people who, who like the equations. Uh, here we have the rescaling of a metric, which is the sort of thing one keeps using, and we have the fact that this vial curvature, which I talked about before, has, uh, is really essentially an invariant object under this, so it survives this Rescaling. There is a geometry there, uh, even though there is a geometry there, even though it's not quite Einstein's geometry. It loses, loses track of the ticking of clock, but you still have the light cones. Um, I've also drawn a picture of this uh, in the three cases of the different this, these three cases here. Uh, thinking of the, um, I've also drawn a picture of this. Uh, in the three cases of the different, this, these three cases here, uh, thinking of the universe in its different phases, you see, is one phase of the universe, it's Big Bang, it goes, runs right through until it expands indefinitely and becomes a new Big Bang and so on, it goes through these cycles. And that's for k equals zero, k, k equals zero is this one, positive k here, negative k is this one, but it works just as well for all the different spatial curvatures. But it does depend on certain things. It depends on all massive things decaying. And I have had some discussions with particle physics colleagues of mine about these things. I mean, how much of a disaster is it if the electron, after a long time, decays into a massless charged particle? OK, that's not conventional particle physics. But is, does that lead you in any, any trouble with conventional part of particle physics? In some pictures, it actually fits in nicely, in others, not so nicely, so I, I don't know. It's, it's, it seems to be a possibility. It would be nice to have a massless neutrino. Uh, that is, uh, 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 neutrinos uh, are known to have differences in masses. There are three kinds, and the differences between the masses of the neutrinos are known, and they're non-zero, but what's not known is whether there is, among them, a neutrino which has zero mass. It could be. Uh, so in this picture, the, it makes, if you like, certain predictions about particle physics. That there should be, I think it says, that there should be massless charged particles, although you can get away with, you can get there are other routes, routes to avoid that, but that does seem to be one of the implications. That's one of the slightly unconventional <laughs> predictions you might come out of this. Now, that, this is all talking about the remote future. It says in the remote future, somehow the universe forgets uh, the passage of time. What about the remote past? Well, in the remote past, the usual picture is that the temperature gets higher and higher and higher as you get into the Big Bang, and the, uh, in the normal picture, that would mean that mass gets less and less important. You can simply ignore mass when you get close to the Big Bang because energies are so great that the masses of any particle uh, that you could have simply uh, could be considered to be zero. So uh, that's also uh, not necessarily the case. There are models in which that's not the case. So it would make some prediction about that too. Uh, 
the other thing which is absolutely key though is you need a var curvature hypothesis that you absolutely do need that the gravitational degrees of freedom are killed off or else it doesn't work the picture is really uh, given more I can show this here uh, I'm afraid the green doesn't show up very well but this is what the sort of trick one plays in this game. You've got the Val curvature and then you define something else which is called the gravitational uh, field tensor which is equal to the Val curvature when the conformal factor is taken to be one but when you go out to infinity or go into the Big Bang you have to introduce this factor and this factor goes to zero uh, at the infinity and goes to infinity at the Big Bang and it has different implications on the two sides uh, at the, its infinity telling you that the gravitational radiation will still ha leave its mark on the future but the vial curvature goes to zero and that means when you match it onto the other side you've got the, a vial curvature hypothesis but it's necessarily the case um, as with regard to the initial state the vial curvature has to be zero otherwise it just doesn't work uh, you see, if you like, in the, in the final state, it scales away. It becomes zero automatically, and it'll only match onto the initial state if it is zero. So at least it, it is a, a model which somehow uh, demands the vial curvature hypothesis as part of it. And I've never seen any other model, crazy model, for what went on before the Big Bang, which has that implication. And it seems to me that's the most important implication, any theory of the Big Bang has to have that implication to be taken seriously because that's the most striking thing, one of the most striking things about the universe is the very, very special nature, the particular form of that <coughs> specialness of the initial state. And uh, maybe, maybe this picture, well, you might say that a picture like this is so wild, how could you ever test it observationally? It's not that wild that it can't be tested observationally because it actually, I think, makes some quite specific predictions for example, about the radiation spectrum of gravitation uh, in, the, in the early stages. Because, you see, you've got to match this to this. So you say, well, what is likely to be the radiation that's hanging around in the remote future? There will be some. It won't all go away. If you have neutron stars going around each other, black holes going around each other, um, producing radiation, that radiation will hang around, make its mark on Scry plus. It will... Not, you won't see it in the vial curvature, you will see it in the derivative of the vial curvature. So there will be a derivative of vial curvature which has to match here with here, and that will tell you something about the initial uh, spectrum of gravitational waves. So although this, uh, these ideas are too new to, so that I can tell you anything in detail about what sort of predictions it makes, uh, it seems to me there are clear predictions. And so let me leave you with that anyway. Maybe that some Billy will come up with something which completely demolishes the whole idea. Uh, that's, that's what science is all about after all. Thank you very much. Questions? Comments? <laughs> yes. You started out with this beautiful exposition about entropy increase and how that really led to the whole thing. But in this case, then what is happening? Yes, I should, I should make a comment about that. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a, that's a, a good question. Um, basically, what's happening here is there's a renormalization. See, when you, you, you have an infinite renormalization as you go from, from one phase to the next, as you go from here to here, whatever it is, the, the phase space volumes... So here you're getting into bigger and bigger volumes, but in a certain sense, of the next phase, the whole picture is identified with the, with the, with the, with the Big Bang region. And it, it involves a rescaling. Because the metric is rescaled by an infinite factor, the, the volumes that you have here also get rescaled by an infinite factor. But I think that that's, you know, one needs to, to look at that a bit more carefully. But it, but it certainly has to be something like that. It's the... Uh, there is, a, there is a, a metric which comes into the, to the measure that one's talking about here. So the thing has changed in the sense, I mean, it's like, in the yeah. sense the future singularity also has zero wild curvature. No, there's no, oh, no. The, the future, sorry, there's no future singularity. Maybe I, I, maybe. Well, 
this is this is thing which is matching. The yes, rate. but that happens yeah. automatically. Yes, th there is another point which I should perhaps I omitted to say, and that is when one thinks about maximum entropy, that the black hole represents maximum entropy. That's not strictly true, and it always used to worry me a bit that if the temperature of the background goes down to below that of the black hole, the black hole will evaporate, and the maximum entropy state is not actually black holes anymore. It's, it's this whole fully expanded universe. And that whole... That's really the, the whole thing, in a sense, in the next phase gets renormalized to the, to the little region which is the Big Bang. But, it, but the, the black holes have disappeared, and one has to have them go through the, the Hawking evaporation process in this, in this picture. But one needs, one needs equations and so on. It's, it's, it's more too much of just an idea with, without fully worked out. And for that, I think one needs to look at the conformal geometry much more seriously. If I understand your idea, Roger, you want the past and the future to be related by some conformal symmetry. Yes. Does that act on the intermediate space-time? It might have a role to play. I think, one need, as I say, one needs equations. And there's something which is a little bit like the sorts of uh, uh, dualities that one sees in, well, in string theory and other theories where you have large-small dualities. And I think there is something like that going on here, that you've got a, a large... Uh, the, the, the very large scale is in some sense the same as the very small scale. And there needs to be some symmetry in, in the whole framework which, which is reflected in that. And we, we but if it acts on the space-time, does it fix a particular... Surface fix uh, a, a moment in time about which the symmetry takes place. Well, it's certainly not a moment. If, if you look at, say, look at this picture, it's probably easiest to talk about. Um, this is this is actually all the way out to infinity as you go here. So there's no moment because it, the moment is infinite, if you like. But in the conformally uh, rescaled space. Well, yes. Just oh yeah. No, you, yeah. There's a moment in that sense. Surface. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It, it, it has to be. It, <laughs> I mean, I think I think it needs the idea simply needs to be developed in various ways. To, you know, as I say, you need it needs equations. You need a formal, a conformal approach. You can rewrite things in terms of the Bach tensor. I had another slide which I was going to show there, but it's really just defining the Bach tensor. One needs to reformulate the whole theory in some kind of conformal gravity form, and and the idea is that in most places you could reconstruct the metric if you wanted to. But there's a sort of singular place here where the reconstruction of the metric becomes degenerate. And so there's a freedom. And, and then you can reconstruct it in more than one way. One way gives you the pre-Big the pre, uh, Big Bang phase, and the next way gives you the post-Big Bang phase. But, but it's in, the theory is incomplete at this moment in that respect. I think it, it needs to be looked at more seriously. semi-exact solution to so-called Gaudi class, where this, this sort of freezing phenomena that sounds very similar to what you're describing has been actually analytically worked out. Uh, have you looked at, do you know that this, is that actually a special case of the structure that you're looking at, this file curvature? I think I missed some of the things you were saying. Uh, sorry. They've got the Gaudi universe. The Gaudi universe, yes. Now, do you have things like that there? <laughs> well, they're not, like, not so much like this, but uh, yes. the sense of the thing freezing. Yes. Yes. I'm not sure whether I'm not an expert on this, but whether you're getting the same sort of um, bile curvature decay in the Gaudi space time as you expect to get in the market. It would be interesting to look at that. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't looked at it, but yes. That would be interesting. Uh, I was going to say something that's gone out of my head. Um, <coughs> there, is, there is a model uh, due to Veneziano which has certain things in common with this. I haven't uh, examined it sufficiently. I don't think it's the same as this, but, but he, he has an also a pre-Big Bang, sort of pre-Big Bang inflationary phase. So in some respects, it's a bit like inflation, you see, cause, because when you're pre-Big Bang, you have uh, a universe which ultimately becomes a de Sitter space. And uh, that, after all, is the model that they look at. You might expect to see scale invariance in, in the fluctuations and so on which would feed through into the next stage here. So there might be an alternative picture to give you the, those, I, I mentioned the, the things about inflation which I don't like, but the good thing about inflation is that it seems to give you this uh, scale invariance in the fluctuation spectrum. Now, is it possible that a model like this would also give you 
something similar because you also have this this exponential expansion. It's just it doesn't happen after the Big Bang. It happened before it. <laughs> so it'd be interesting to see what you can do with that. Yeah, I can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. There's another version of the three Big Bang theory. Yes, no, not, not, not Veneziano, yes. Yes, yeah, the cyclic universe model. Okay. Which does exactly what it looks like this. Okay, I'd like... It's uh, scalar variant perturbation before the Big Bang. Yes, well, I'd be interested... Um, of course, the big problem is getting across the singularity. So maybe you could answer mm -hmm. why you think the dynamics are those of the conformally invariant field in the vicinity of the singularity. Well, it's basically... Um, Einstein isn't conformally I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but in the picture here, uh, the thing is perfectly smooth conformally. So you could imagine writing down equations and so on. They're not quite Einstein because you have to eliminate the conformal scale f and then ho see whether you can reconstruct it. That's the sort of point. So I'm saying you can reconstruct it here, but they've become uh, sort of degenerate places where the, the reconstruction leads you to ambiguities. And so you have the, the two possibilities on the one side and the other. some sort of theory which is conformally invariant in the vicinity of the singularity, but away from it will reduce to Einstein. Um, sorry, I did miss some of what you said there. Sorry. <laughs> You're envisaging a theory which is conformally invariant. Yes. Well, I, that's what I would consider trying first. I mean, maybe you have to oh. do something else. But yes, that would be a way of getting through here. Right. And so you'd have a conformally invariant theory which, which allows you to put mass back when there are certain parameters. It's like saying you have a Higgs field which is, which is constant over big regions. Well, here we say it's a Higgs field which is transfer transformable to constant over big regions. And that would be a particular solution to the, to the, to the equations. But again, this sort, of, this sort of happens in string theory, where as you approach certain singularities, yeah. the dilaton field runs off to infinity. <coughs> the interpretation of that is the string becomes massless. I see, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me there are things in common with it. I, I, I just have to, I'd have to see. I'd be, you know, I'd be interested in things like this, so... Yeah, thank you. I think it's probably time that we uh, stopped keeping you from the drinks. Um, and uh, I hope that you won't um, carry out the same experiment that was shown in one slide. Um, and it only remains really on behalf both of the society and I'm sure of our audience to thank all three speakers for providing us with a really excellent Spitalfield Day. Thank you very much.